Today's video is brought to you by Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury attorney law firm ready to fight for you. When dealing with the consequence of injury, sometimes it can feel like you have no options and that receiving proper compensation just isn't plausible. But Morgan & Morgan is here to fight for you. Did you know that proper representation from a lawyer is said to gain on average three times more compensation than fighting a case on your own? With 800 attorneys in 49 different states covering a major range of specialties and expertise, Morgan & Morgan will fight to get you the compensation you deserve. And the best part, Morgan & Morgan operates using a no-win, no-fee basis to put your mind at ease while you focus on getting justice. If you're interested in what you hear, check out Morgan & Morgan for yourself by clicking the link in the description of this video, or using your phone, you can dial pound law. That's pound 529. Or visit www.forthepeople.com to get started on receiving the compensation you deserve. Number one on today's list is suspected of having been involved in up to 70 murders by law enforcement during his 30 plus year run as an enforcer for not only himself and his brother Michael Meldish, who was leader of the infamous East Harlem Purple Gang up until being executed in a mob hit with a gunshot wound to the head while sitting in his car in the Bronx back on September 15, 2013, but also acting as a hitman for both the Genovese and Lucchese crime families. Joseph Meldish, the younger brother to Michael, was arrested and pleaded guilty to manslaughter when he was just 18 years old, and on March 10th of 1976, he would be paroled after just three years. In September of 1981, it's said that Joseph Meldish and John Goya got into an altercation at a social club in the Bronx, and the two men decided to take it outside. Goya then threw a live grenade at Meldish, but when it didn't go off, Authorities suspect Meldish then shot the man, although no witnesses would come forward. Meldish wouldn't be indicted until 2009. According to a Bronx homicide lieutenant, Meldish ruled the neighborhood throughout the years through a lot of intimidation and is known for a few of his infamous acts of violence. One of those incidents took place in 1984, when some gang members jumped and beat a man, also stealing $350 from him. And after Meldish threatened to kill him if he went to the cops, the man checked into the witness protection program. Meldish would again be arrested for drug possession after buying drugs with money he earned through intimidation. It's said Meldish would just walk into bars and swipe the customer's money off the counter. And if anyone would act up, Meldish would either start blasting his gun or leave and come back with a baseball bat. After a one-time drug dealer named Tommy Brown refused Meldish's request to borrow $20 back in 1999, Meldish then burglarized Brown's home. Tommy Brown initially went to the cops over the incident, but ultimately ended up choosing to not press charges. And it's said although Brown didn't want problems with them, Meldish still decided to retaliate against Brown. And one of Meldish's crew members, David Thong, would drive both Joseph Meldish and a crack-addicted prostitute named Kim Hazlick to a bar called Frenchie's Tavern in the Throgs Neck section of the Bronx, where Brown was known to hang out. Kim Hazlick would slide into the bar to locate Brown, quickly returning to Meldish, telling him he was seated with his wife at the second to last table on the right. Meldish put on a ski mask and then barged in and shot the man eight times, killing him instantly. The problem is, Kim spotted the wrong man. She mistook Brown's similar-looking brother, Joey Brown, for Tommy. And once again, although authorities know Meldish was responsible for the hit, the case wouldn't go anywhere because no witnesses would come forward. But in 2009, Meldish getaway driver Thong flipped on the feared killer in order to receive immunity for his involvement. The ADA on the case would come to court with a stack of subpoenas calling some of the scared witnesses to testify. After two jurors revealed they knew about Joseph Meldish and were afraid of him, they were removed from the case, as well as the jury forewoman who was excused after finding out the verdict would be read in open court. On top of that, the whole jury would request a private readout in the back of the court out of fear that Meldish relatives might retaliate. Ultimately, the jury would hold strong, convicting him of murder. According to the book Hitmen, the Mafia, Drugs, and the East Harlem Purple Gang, the Meldish brothers were ruthless and heavily involved with members of Cosa Nostra, but could never be made because they were not Italian. The book also states that law enforcement described Meldish as a heroin addict with a hair-trigger temper, 
and goes on to say he served as a lethal enforcer for the Purple Gang. Depending on which source you believe, Joseph Meldish's body count varies between 30 to 40 to 70 to as many as 100 victims over as many years on the streets. Number 2. Abe Kid Twist Reels Another member of the ruthless and deadly crew of Jewish gangsters and contract killers for the mob known as Murder Incorporated, Abe Kid Twist Reels was a chief enforcer alongside Pittsburgh Phil before he later flipped and testified against his partner in crime. Kid Twist was known to be as ruthless and violent as they come. Born in Brownsville, Brooklyn on May 10, 1906, Reels was the son of Jewish and Austrian immigrants, stealing his nickname Kid Twist from a childhood gangster idol. By 1940, when Abe Reels was just 34 years old, he had already been arrested a total of 42 times, including six times for murder, also serving a total of six prison terms. Reel would drop out of school in eighth grade and begin his journey into his life of crime, partnering up with his childhood friends, Harry Pittsburgh, Phil Strauss, and Martin Bugsy Goldstein, all three members of Murder, Inc. In 1921, Reels would catch his first charge after he stole $2 worth of gum from a vending machine and would be ordered to serve four months at Children's Village at Dobbs Ferry, a New York juvenile asylum created to provide shelter to both orphans and juvenile delinquents. The juvenile offenders would be shipped off to the Midwest to spend time with farm families to distance them from the dangers that come with being involved in the streets. The kids would travel on what they called orphan trains and the asylum alone would house 6,323 children between 1855 and 1903. The residential care facility would come to be known as the precursor to the foster care system. But Reel's four month of farm life wouldn't keep him away from his ambitions to become a serious member of organized crime. Reels, who was of short stature, wouldn't let his small size stop him from committing violent, ruthless acts. It said Reel's weapon of choice was an ice pick, his signature move stabbing his target's brain through their right ear. Some say Reel got so skilled with his ice pick method that some coroners believed his victims died of cerebral hemorrhage. Kid Twist would go on to be known as one of the more brazen and psychopathic killers of his time. In one instance, he's said to have attacked a car wash employee in broad daylight for missing a spot on his fender. And in another instance, Reels killed a parking lot attendant for failing to retrieve his car quick enough. On another occasion, Reels is said to have took one of his victims to his mother's house for dinner. And after Reels' mother had left the table, Reels and an accomplice would murder the man and dispose of the body. Reels, who grew up in Brooklyn his whole life, was also a bootlegger, but was said to have personally hated alcohol. Reels and childhood friend Goldstein would start working for the Shapiro brothers, who were running the Brooklyn Rackets at the time when the two were teenagers. They would start off committing petty crimes for the brothers, but when Reels got pinched and was sentenced to two years in an upstate New York juvenile detention center and the Shapiro brothers refused to help Reels, he began plotting revenge on the brothers. Following Reels' release, him along with Goldstein and a man named George DeFeo would enter the slot machine business, a racket already claimed by the Shapiro brothers. But Goldstein and Reels would make a smart move striking up a deal with major influential crime lord Meyer Lansky in exchange for access to the poor neighborhoods in Brooklyn. The agreement between the two would prove to be successful, Lansky locking down neighborhoods like Brownsville, Ocean Hill, and East New York, and Kid Twist would get the Meyer Lansky stamp and backing of his crew, helping him prosper in business and helping to keep him alive. Reels, along with Pittsburgh Phil and Goldstein, were said to be partners in all their criminal endeavors, starting from the slot machines. The trio would quickly expand the business, getting into crap games, loan sharking, and labor racketeering in regards to union activities, mainly having a stronghold on the restaurant union. The men's slot business would blow up, and Reels and Goldstein would end up being marked on William Irving and Meyer Shapiro's hit list. One night after the two men got a phone call from a supposed friend telling them that the Shapiro brothers had just left their headquarters in East New York, they decided they would act first and hit the brothers before they could get to them. But when they pulled up, they were ambushed by shooters, leaving both Reels and Goldstein wounded, but the both of them were able to escape. Following the attempted execution of the duo, Meyer Shapiro would kidnap Abe Reels' current girlfriend, and after dragging her into a field, 
he would proceed to beat her and her. Rios, in his attempt to avenge the brutal attack on his girlfriend, would recruit two fellow members of Murder, Inc., Frank Abendano and Harry Happy Mayone, who were glad to help with plans to take over some of the three brothers' rackets. Both sides would go back and forth with several attempts to assassinate each other, but Rios would come out on top after running up on brother Irving Shapiro, breaking into his home and dragging him from his living room into the street, where he kicked and beat him before finishing him off with multiple gunshots. Reels then cut up with Meyer Shapiro in the street and killed him by shooting him in the face. Three years after getting the first two brothers, Reels would catch up with the last of the three, William Shapiro, kidnapping him off the street and taking him to the gang's hideout where he would be beaten within inches of his life and stuffed into a sack. The crew would then drive Shapiro's body to Brooklyn to the Canarsie section where they would bury him alive. The men were spotted by passerbys, causing them to flee before they could fully finish the job. The police would then exhume the body where the autopsy revealed suffocation as the cause of death. After being implicated in multiple murders, acting as a hitman for himself and his murdering gang of killers, Kid Twist would flip and become a government witness, turning on his longtime friends and partner in crime, as well as other high-ranking members of Cosa Nostra. Some of the men who would be implicated by Reel's cooperation would include his childhood friends Bugsy Goldstein, Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss, Frank Abendano, Harry Mayone, Louis Lepke, Louis Capone, Mendy Weiss, and Irving the Plug Nitzberg. Reels would supply the authorities with information regarding 70 different unsolved murders performed by and under contract with the Murder, Inc. hit squad. All of the men listed except for Irving Nitzberg would be convicted and executed. Abe Reels wasn't finished with his last and final murder spree. Next, he would cooperate against the high-ranking Cosa Nostra member and co-chief of Murder, Inc. operations, Albert Anastasia implicating him in the murder of a Union longshoreman named Pete Ponto. The trial against Anastasia, which was based only on the testimony of Reels, was scheduled for November 12, 1941. While awaiting trial, Reels was placed under heavy police protection in a Coney Island hotel under the constant guard and supervision of 18 different guards on three different shifts during the early morning hours of November 12, 1941. Reels would still manage to fall to his death out of a window from the 6th floor room 6223 with guards posted outside his door. Authorities later located a homemade rope made of bed sheets and a wire suspect to be made by Reels on the 5th floor balcony and he would meet his demise by landing on the 2nd floor balcony looking like he was attempting to escape. Five of the officers on guard that day were demoted the next day and it's been widely speculated that Abe Reels was either pushed or thrown out the window and the officers staged the room to look like an escape, being that Reels never attempted to or showed signs of escaping and was reported to have feared the police. It's been said that Frank Costello bribed the guards with $100,000 to take Reels out in order to save Albert Anastasia who was facing trial that day, where the whole case was based solely on Reels testimony. In 1951, a grand jury declared Abriel's death was an accident due to an escape attempt. Mafia informant Joseph Falacci would later be quoted saying, I never met anybody who believed Abe went out that window because he wanted to. And last but not least, number three on today's list, Roy DeMeo. The butcher and murder machine are just some of the terms associated with the infamous Gambino gangster. DeMeo was the leader of a crew of brutal and vicious killers who in all are suspected of killing up to 200 people before DeMeo himself would meet his own demise in a mob hit orchestrated by Gambino boss Paul Castellano back on January 10, 1983. DeMeo would be killed by members of his own crew and stuffed into the trunk of his 1983 Cadillac with the chandelier Roy had in his car to be fixed placed on top of him. And with freezing temperatures at the time, Ten days later, the frozen body of Roy DeMeo would be discovered by police, parked in the parking lot of the Bayside Boat Club in Brooklyn after police towed the car and popped the trunk open. DeMeo had been subpoenaed by a federal grand jury to testify for the second time in a racketeering case just a few weeks earlier, and DeMeo, who knew all too well how and why people get whacked in the mafia, 
even told his son he knew he had a target on his back and was marked for death. After an international car theft ring being run by DeMeo had been busted, implicating the Gambino boss Paul Castellano, who would be charged in the case on top of multiple other felonies. And out of fear that DeMeo, who knew too much about Castellano's dark side, ordered his men to take Roy out. But before we get into who exactly fired the fatal shots that took Roy out, let's get into some of the more brutal hits DeMeo and his sick crew of psychopathic killers are said to have been involved in. DeMeo's first victim of his soon-to-be historic killing spree was said to be the premier distributor of pornographic films in New York, Paul Rothenberg. Rothenberg was being extorted by DeMeo and DeMeo's captain, Nino Gaggi. So after law enforcement raided Rothenberg's film processing business and began questioning him about bank checks he had been giving to DeMeo, Nino Gaggi decided it would be best to silence Rothenberg before he got a chance to sing. The hit was given to DeMeo by Gaggi and the butcher would lure Rothenberg to an alley located in Roslyn, Long Island, where he would tail him in and fire a 38 with a silencer twice into Rothenberg's head. This hit would awaken DeMeo's evil and sinister side and lead him down a bloody and deadly path that would go down in history as one of the most brutal murder sprees Costa Nostra has ever seen. Roy DeMeo was a former butcher's apprentice and would brag how he would use the skills he learned slicing meat to dismember his victims, slicing and chopping them up for easy disposal. The vicious crew would then place the body parts in the garbage bags and box them up to be shipped to Brooklyn's Fountain Avenue dump. DeMeo and his crew were so efficient as contract killers that they had a name for the way they killed their victims called the Gemini Method. The men would lure and lead their target in through the side door of their main hangout, the Gemini Lounge, and walk them towards the back by the bar, where DeMeo would pop out with a silenced pistol and shoot them in the head. Someone else would quickly wrap a towel around the head to prevent making a mess, and another person would stab them through the heart to stop the blood flow. Once all those steps were completed, the body would be dragged into the bathtub and hung upside down to drain the blood from the body in the apartment connected to the Gemini Lounge, which was being rented by DeMeo's cousin and DeMeo crew member, Joseph Dracula Guglielmo. The apartment would later be nicknamed the Horror Hotel because of all the gruesome murders that took place there over the years. Most of DeMeo's hits took place with different members of the DeMeo crew, which included the Gemini twins, Anthony Center and Joey Testa, Dracula, Nino Gaggi's nephew, Dominic Montiglio, Henry Borelli, Chris Rosenberg, Danny Grillo, Joey's little brother, Patrick Testa, Richard and Frederick Denome, Carlo Profeta, and Vito Arena. Now, as we know, all the hits the crew committed haven't been disclosed, but a few lists have been put together with the hits that have been documented. And the biggest list I was able to come across consisted of 62 men murdered by Roy DeMeo and Nino Gaggi, as well as various members of the crew, plus another nine possible victims. Another hit on the list that stands out that Roy was said to be involved in would be the brutal murder of 23-year-old Andre Katz, who would meet his demise on June 13, 1975. Katz was a 23-year-old Romanian Jewish immigrant living in New York City in the 1970s. Katz, who was also a criminal involved in drug dealing and stealing cars, became involved with the DeMeo crew through DeMeo's self-proclaimed son, Harvey Chris Rosenberg, after the two were introduced to a pharmacist that was a customer at the very best foreign car services in Flatlands, Brooklyn, where Katz worked, and was also Rosenberg's connection for both quaaludes and cocaine. Rosenberg also owned a body shop near Katz, and the two would become close after Rosenberg offered to sell him stolen car parts, and Rosenberg began bringing him around the other guys in the DeMeo crew. Katz would begin buying coke to sell from Rosenberg, buy a 38 caliber pistol, and get involved in a deal with the crew that had to do with the stealing of a fleet of vans. One of Katz's friends who bought a van from him would be stopped by cops who informed him the car was coming back stolen, and the friend told police that he bought it from Andre Katz, who would be arrested in October of 1974. The NYPD Auto Crimes Unit would press Katz hard, but he would refuse to talk. Katz would make bail, and almost right after he was released, he would meet up and be confronted by Rosenberg and brothers Patrick and Joey Testa, who threatened him not to go to the police about any of their business on the street. 
Katz was already mad at Rosenberg for putting a bad VIN on the car, and an argument broke out between the two. The following day, the two would get into a second argument, which ended with Katz being punched in the face. Two days later, Katz got ambushed and ripped out of his car and attacked by two men wearing ski masks, putting Katz in the hospital. He had a severely swollen face and couldn't talk for three days. Katz would later tell his brother, Victor Katz, that his attackers were Joey Testa and Anthony Center. At first, Katz was said to be scared to walk around alone after leaving the hospital, but would soon have a change of heart and decided he would retaliate on Rosenberg by staking out his body shot one morning and shooting at him with an automatic rifle, striking him once in the jaw, causing him a small disfigurement on the lower part of his face, but he would survive the shot. The DeMeo crew's revenge on Andre Katz was inevitable, but due to a couple of legal issues after Center and Testa were pulled over and arrested in front of the Gemini Lounge after being busted carrying loaded handguns on November 19, 1974. With the financial help of Roy DeMeo, the twins' legal team would get them a sweet sentence of probation, and the revenge plot on Katz would be postponed. The crew made one attempt which didn't work out so decided to hold off due to heavy law enforcement surveillance. But then in January of 1975, the mayor would get a tip from an auto crimes detective on his payroll that Katz had visited the Brooklyn DA to volunteer information regarding Chris Rosenberg's criminal activities. The mayor would immediately order Borelli to enlist his female friend to set the trap on Katz and lure him in. And finally, on June 13, 1975, Katz would be lured to an apartment complex for a supposed date, but would be abducted by the DeMeo crew and taken to the meat department of a supermarket, where he was stabbed multiple times in the heart and back by a butcher knife and then dismembered. The crew would then cut Katz's head off, and it would be placed into a garbage compactor by Roy DeMeo. They would then put the body parts in garbage bags and toss them into the supermarket dumpster but Cat's body and head would be discovered by police after a pedestrian found a leg on the sidewalk while she was walking her dog. All the police would tell the press was that a brutal, grisly murder had occurred. Andre Katz would be identified through dental records two days later. The male who lived by the code of no body, no crime, cut up another pair of unsuspecting car ring members after luring them to a dark building and shooting them dead. According to the testimony of Vito Arena, who later flipped after Roy and another unnamed gunman killed the two guys, DeMeo said, quote, we have to cut them up. And while cutting the bodies up, Roy ordered Henry Borelli to go get some pizza and hot dogs. Another one of the more notable hits Roy DeMeo said to be involved in was a young 18-year-old college kid who was a vacuum cleaner salesman selling vacuums door to door who happened to pull up in front of the wrong house at the wrong time. Roy DeMeo, who was currently on high alert after Chris Rosenberg had ripped off some powerful Cubans from Miami for coke and killed four of their men in the process, leaving DeMeo and Gadgie to clean up the mess. DeMeo seen the kid pull in front of his house and he mistook him for a Cuban assassin, started approaching him with a gun out. The kid seen him approaching and took off in his car, which led to a car chase with DeMeo firing shots while out in public in broad daylight. Eventually catching up to him, leaping from his car, DeMeo would fire the fatal shots. This mistake wasn't a good look for DeMeo with this captain who's already being told by his boss, the boss, Big Paul Castellano, that it might be time for Roy to go. With Vito Arena spilling everything to the feds and Castellano and Nino Gaggi, along with 21 others, including the remaining surviving DeMeo crew members set to face charges of not only the car theft ring, but 25 murders related to it, loan sharking, drug trafficking, fraud, extortion, and prostitution. Hearing that DeMeo was set to testify for a second time was all Big Paul needed to hear. In 1982, during a wiretap phone call between two Gambino members, Angelo Ruggiero and Gene Gotti, the FBI would overhear the two discussing a contract on Roy's life being ordered by Castellano, because according to Paul, he was bringing too much heat down on the family. On the tape phone call, John Gotti's brother Gene is heard telling Ruggiero how Gotti was weary of DeMeo because of the amount of killers he had around him, also pointing out how John had less than 10 kills under his belt compared to the 30 plus kills they only knew about that Roy had killed. 
It said the Gotti crew would then delegate the hit to DeMeo's own men through Frank DeChico, stating that they themselves weren't able to get close enough. Around this time, DeMeo, who was super paranoid fearing he would be targeted, was traveling around with a sawed-off shotgun under his trench coat at all times. But on January 10, 1983, DeMeo told his son he was leaving to go to a meeting and would never return. The information that has been pieced together through different accounts of government cooperators, DeMeo will be lured to the home of Patrick Testa, where Joey Testa and Anthony Center were said to have fired seven shots into Roy's head, leaving the Gemini twin signature murder style of a gunshot behind each ear. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Fellas, wise guys. 